What's going on? It's your man, Kobe. Welcome to another episode of Counter Kobe, where I just pretty much want to talk with you guys about different topics that have been going on in music this week. So if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Go and check out all the other content on Brand Man. Most of it is educational, just not this show. But like I said, this is pretty much a way for me to see what you guys think on these various music topics. See if we agree, if we disagree, if we can debate, or if we can just chop it up about it from a mutual, neutral standpoint. Outside of that, come and follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kobe the Savior. Like I said, I love to hear what you guys think on these topics, so you might as well come and share your opinions with me. Let's talk about all of this stuff. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into today's topics. Now, the first thing that I want to touch on, and if you know about this, man, if you know about this, you're probably just as equally disappointed as I am, right? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, after I talk about it, you are going to be just as equally disappointed as I am. So, Corey, what are you talking about, bro? I am talking about Tory Lanez versus Interscope. Now, Tory Lanez has been very vocal about his beef and his displeasement. Displeasement? Is that a word? His displeasement with his record label in the scope for a minute, at least for the last couple of weeks. He even took to Instagram, I would say about a week and a half ago, and he posted a post. Um, it said, Interscope Records, if y'all niggas don't stop playing with me, I'm exposed what's really going on in that fucking building. Now, it's speculation that he's mad at Interscope over his recent Chicks Take Five project. Now, if you're not familiar with Tory Lanez, you never really like checked into Tory Lanez like that. He's been doing this Chicks Take mixtape series since he's been an underground artist where he pretty much takes popular R&B songs, he samples them, he flips them, and then he makes them his own thing and then he puts them out. So like I said, he released the most popular version of it to date being Chicks Take Five. And the rumor that's going around is that his team and him are mad that Interscope did not help to fund that project. Now his manager, um, what's his manager's name? Uh, excuse me if I get this wrong, but his manager, Sasha Gutenfreund, um, spoke to DJ Booth and what she pretty much said was that Interscope contributed, but they didn't cover all of our costs. Tory is not afraid to invest in himself. So if you know anything about just how music works, right? You know that one of the most expensive things in music is the sample clearing process. Shit, even the work that goes into clearing a sample is a lot for a small team to handle because you have to literally hunt down all the people who own the rights to these different songs and then get them to agree on a price to, you know, so that you can use it for your project, your song, your whatever. So just not even thinking about the marketing budget, not even thinking about the publicity budget, the art budget, the wardrobe budget, the video budget. Tory Lanez definitely dropped the bag on features alone. And I'm thinking that me being a major label artist, signed to a major label with just this large staff that's supposed to be at my disposal, especially with, you know, I would think that Tory Lanez is a priority artist, uh, priority artist at Interscope. You would think that the label would help him with that. You would think that we either offset some of the costs or, like I said, put in some of the work to actually get these samples clear. But it's not what Tory Lanez and his team have been saying. They're saying that Interscope has had no help in that whatsoever. So last night, last night as of me making this video, he took to Instagram again, once again getting our hopes up, and he posted, everybody meet me on my IG live at 7 p.m. We're going to start this Interscope shit. Can't take this no more. He then posted a separate post um, that says something like, to my fellow artists, if anything happens to me in any part of this process, I did it all for my upcoming artists to be smarter with these deals and to be in a better position for your families and to be aware of the dangers even when your business is right. So what got me with this, because personally, I'm not the biggest Tory Lanez fans musically. I think he's a cool guy. He seems like a very intelligent, knowledgeable guy that knows what he's got going on, and I do like that about him. Um, but he was pretty much painting himself to be the Batman or the Robin Hood of the underground or the indie artist community, right? I took it as him saying, look, I'm going to expose Interscope for some of these practices that they've been doing so that hopefully you, the artist that's coming up, can learn from this situation and not end up in the same position that I'm in. And we don't see that too much from artists, especially major label artists who are in a prime position, right? At the most, we've gotten what, like Metro Boomin' and Sunny Digital call out a couple, uh, a couple of heads. Like we get it every now and then, we'll get an artist who kind of comes out and talks about some of these situations, some of these deals, but it's rare that we get it while they're in the deal, living out the terms of the contract, 
and benefiting from what the label has to offer them. But I guess if we take it from Tory Lane's standpoint, he's feeling like I did all the work for this project. I did all this to get I did all this to get it together, did all the, the, the back breaking labor work on top of the work that I had to do as an artist to actually create the art. You're contributing from it or you're profiting from it, and we don't feel like you contributed enough to the project as a whole. So I do see his point in this. Like I said, I was very excited for him to take to IG Live and air this out for us. I waited, bro. Like I, I looked at it at like 710, my time here in Atlanta. He wasn't on live. My roommate brought the point of like, yo, bro, you don't know where this man at. He might be in L.A. I'm like, all right, great point. That's a good point. So I waited to about 10.15 my time, 7.15 L.A. time. Still nothing. Woke up this morning and the original post that he posted saying he was going to go live had been taken down. So I'm guessing that whatever he was going through yesterday either got resolved or it got snuffed out or, you know, they hit him up and he's like, yo, cut that shit out. Either way, like I said, I was disappointed because I was looking forward to it because I like to see artists air that shit out and let the rest of us know what's up so that we can all move a little bit smarter, right? Like, why, why save the danger for the next man when you can protect everybody? So hopefully Tory Lanez doesn't renege on his comments. Hopefully he does let us know what's going on in this situation. Like I said, speculations is that it's over the sample clearance and how much money it cost and how much work it took to make that happen which they didn't really, they don't feel like they really got any help from Interscope regarding that. But like I said, until he speaks on it, we don't really know. But hopefully he airs something out in the next couple of weeks because he did in, in his original Instagram post say, we doing this shit for 30 days straight. I'm airing everybody out. So let's pay attention. Let's see. Let me know what you guys think. Do you think it's over the sample clearances? Do you think it's over something else? Do you think he even needs to talk about it? Just let me know what you guys think about that in the comment section below. Moving on, let's touch on this yellow card versus Juice World lawsuit. So I saw a lot of Juice World fans just up in arms this week when it was announced that the band yellow card was still pursuing their $15 million lawsuit against um, Juice World's team and Nick Mira and his production company for allegedly sampling a song from that album in 2006 without giving them any credit, giving them any compensation for it. Now, they did extend the case out of respect for Juice World's death, right? So it was been reported that the defense originally had until December 9th to pretty much get all the documents together. And Yellow Card extended it to February 4th, but made it very clear that they were still pursuing this $15 million lawsuit. And like I said, I saw a lot of, lot of Juice World fans up in arms about this, which lets me know those guys don't know the business, right? Because it is completely fair, completely honest, for an artist who feels like their work had been used or sampled to seek compensation, especially for a song that big. Now, I think a lot of this negative backlash comes from the fact that Sting already took 90% of Lucid Dreams, right? Earlier this year, Juice World and his team was in a legal dispute with the band Sting over Lucid Dreams, and he ended up losing about 90% of that song to Sting. They own 90% of that song. So already what we're seeing is that the artist and his team and the label are splitting a very small part of the pie, right? Albeit, it's probably a very expensive small part of the pie, but still a small portion of the pie at 10%. And then now we see yellow card coming in and affecting that 10% even more. And like I said, man, business is business. Like just because something tragic happened or something unfortunate happened, doesn't mean that it stops the legal proceedings of a business move. It doesn't feel like there's anything personal. Yellow Card even released a statement um, saying, you know, how, how unfortunate it was that we lost Juice World and how they offered their condolences to his family and his fan base. And they didn't have to do that because it's not like this is a, you know, it's not like there's, they're, they're suing him out of malicious intent. It's just, yo, man, that's our song or your song. And we would like to get paid for it. I even looked at it like this, like, just like the Sting situation, if they wanted to, they could have probably come in and taken or come in and take the rest of that 10%, assuming it gets proved that it is their music. So the fact that they asked for a hard number, $15 million, is completely reasonable to me because that song has definitely made way more than $15 million. Like that song alone, not to mention all the other hits and classics, you know, not classics, but other hits and to be soon, will be soon classics that Juice World has produced that is generating a large amount of money. So $15 million, when you look at it like that, 
isn't really shit when they could have asked for an entire percentage of the song for the lifespan of that song. So I actually think they went pretty lean on this. My guess being that they're probably familiar with the Steam case too, or maybe they just genuinely like Juice World's music. They didn't want to do him like that. Like I said, like it's, I think it's completely fair for an artist to go, hey, you're using my song. I would like to get compensation for this song. Let's work something out. So like I said, if you're if you're up in arms about this, you just you just don't know the business, man. This is this is completely fair to me. Um, it's completely I, I think it's I don't know I don't I don't see it ending in a in a really negative way. I haven't really seen like Taz Taylor and Nick Mirror speak too badly against or even really speak out about it. Um, like I said, it was just something I noticed that Juice World fans was just like on their ass about like yo man that's that's fucked up. He just passed all these things. But like I said, man, business is business. Business has to go on despite certain unfortunate or tragic events. And the biggest thing you can learn from this situation is if you're going to sample a song, if you're going to use somebody else's song, make sure you get it clear. Now, we can't attribute that completely to Juice World because Lucy Dreams was made before he was such a megastar artist. And most artists that are not big don't even think about that. So if nothing else, use this case as a study on why you should be up on your business even when you feel like you know the business has to call it to you because eventually you could be giving up 90 percent of your song and 15 million and no one's going to feel bad for you because it's completely justified moving on i want to touch on your favorite rainbow headed rapper and his sentencing pretty much um this will probably be the last time i talk about the six nine case for a minute just because at this point i don't know what else could be covered on but it just the internet was just so up in arms this week about it that I just felt like something had to be said. So originally it was rumored that 6ix9ine was getting out that same day that this rumor started. It was going around 6ix9ine to be released today, 6ix9ine to be released in 24 hours. However, what we later saw was that was not the case and the official sentencing that has been passed on to Juice, well not Juice World, to 6ix9ine is that he will have 24 months, he will have to serve 24 months with his 13 months that he's already done, counted as time served, five years of supervision, 300 hours of community service, and a $35,000 fine. Now, when you really look into the details of it, this is a very light sentence. Like I said, he got 24 months with them counting the 13 months that he's already served as time served, meaning that he really only has about 11 months and that's not even including good behavior and all that extra stuff that starts to go into account for it once the sentencing or once the time being served actually starts. On top of that, once he get out, he's not going to be the same 6ix9ine that some of us know and love because he's going to be being watched for five years, meaning that he can't go on these Test My Gangsta World Tours. He can't do all of this ignorant stuff that he was doing before because he is going to run the risk of ending up right back in jail. One thing that I will say I appreciate about the judge on this case is that at least at least it seemed like he wasn't going for 6 9s bullshit as far as trying to play the victim and painting himself out to be this, you know, kid who got romanticized by these fairy godhood niggas who put money up to fund his dreams. The judge was not going for that. The judge was making it clear to 6 9 that he was very aware of the roles that he played in all of the activities of the game. Pretty much saying that, yes, you're right. There are certain members that we could not have gotten without you. You were very instrumental in that, but let's not sit here and pretend like you didn't incite or start. A lot of these very serious crimes that had us looking at them, you know, for the last couple of months in the first place, like you were the catalyst for a lot of these things. Um, so one of the things, I'm gonna read some of these messages here. So. Judge Inglemeyer, uh, these are some of his statements. This is him reading out to 6 9 during the court. So, for the better part of the year, you were part of a violent gang, so that there's no misunderstanding. Here's a specific account of those acts. First came Trippy Red. You decided to shoot at a member of Trippy Red's entourage. Um, what else? Next was Chief Keith. He was in New York. You were in LA. You offered 20000 to shoot at Chief Keith outside the W Hotel. You later gave 10000 Then you went to LA. A robber was live streaming in Smurf Village. Jordan offered to shoot. You said, okay. When you pled guilty, you admitted to attempting to commit murder on April 3rd, 2018 with a record label in Texas. He's talking about rap -a -lot Records. You drove to 40th Street and 8th Avenue. Kefano Jordan robbed the musicians at gunpoint. 
and Mr. Hernandez, I've given it a lot of close thought, including your cooperation. The following are my thoughts, and this is going to take a little while. You are in custody for 13 months. I agree you deserve a great deal of credit for your cooperation. I appreciate it. The means, whether at your expense or mine, but I need to say nine trade was violent, not to be glorified. Cooperation of criminal insiders is a necessary tool. Imagine the members of nine trade free today that there was the slashing victim. I have no doubt that the process of cooperation has for you been cathartic. For all these reasons, you deserve a very substantial reduction and you will receive. I followed some of the commentary during the trial. I took it, much of it, in good fun. That was kind of weird, right? So the lawyer's admitting, I saw the memes, I seen the talk around it. It was comical, I enjoyed it, but at the end of the day, this was some serious shit. You're gonna have to do some serious time for it. We can't just slap you on the wrist and let it out. Even though I will argue that 24 months with 13 months served is a slap on the wrist, because I'm pretty sure we all know people who've done a lot less that have gotten worse serious times. Shit, even the rest of the non-trade members who were prosecuted, I think the lowest sentence serving uh, that was given was five years. And some of those people, like I said, weren't even the, the ones who incited a lot of the criminal acts that actually really put them on the, the FBI's radar this year, right? A lot of those things were done by 6 9 and then now he tried to hop out of it and cop the plea of, oh, your honor, I'm just a kid. I didn't know any better. Like I said, I was wooed by these fairy godhood niggas who had bread to put me up and help me chase my dreams. So the only thing that I'm going to be interested in outside of this, because like I said, I don't agree with the life sentencing. I'm not saying that I wanted him to get life for 40 years, but something that at least set an example. Like if you're going to use this case as an example to show to the rap community or whatever community you're trying to speak to that, hey, it's okay to cooperate and work with the police and talk to the police when it's saving lives, then you should also set the example of, but if you were in cooperation with these people, there would still be consequences for it, but we will thank you for it and we will appreciate you for it. We didn't get that. So I'm looking at like, he's not gonna come out with really anything learned. I'm interested to see his rebrand because I a thousand percent believe that he's going to just jump into the Latin music market. Like we're gonna start seeing six nine on songs with like Bad Bunny and Cardi B in Spanish and he's he's not gonna come back into the rap world whatsoever. So I don't know, like I said, that's that's all pretty much at this point. When there's more that's worth talking about outside of this, this was just significant because of the, the rumor that was going around. And then, like I said, the actual sentencing with the 24 months plus time served, plus the five years of supervision, 300 hours of community service, and the $35,000 fine that he's probably going to pay the day he gets out. So slap on the wrist for a major artist like 6 9 Now, lastly, what I want to talk about is... Um, Kind of goes towards the whole artist and mental health conversation that we had. If you looked at the episode where I talked about Summer Walker and why she canceled a lot of her show dates, you know, uh, uh, alluding to a lot of it being due to the fact that she just didn't feel in a well mental space. This relates to that same conversation and some of those same sentiments that I was talking about, about how we don't really talk a lot about how major artists are probably going to certain forms of just PTSD or mental health disorders from being in the spotlight so much. So. Andre 3000 did an interview with Rick Rubin for his Broken Record podcast, which if you've never listened to that podcast, I a thousand percent recommend it. It's just Rick Rubin having conversations with different music professionals and creators about their headspace and where they're at. And it's, it's, it's dope, man. Like Rick Rubin is a really cool interviewer because he's so chill, right? So in the interview, Andre 3000 pretty much was asked or was talking about why we've never gotten a solo under 3000 project. And if we're going to get a solo under 3000 project and he let off the sentiments of he would like for there to be one, but he doesn't feel like it's coming. So let me read out some of these quotes, right? So I haven't been making much music, man. Uh, that's what under 3000 is saying to Rick Rubin. I haven't been making much music, man. My focus is not there. My confidence is not there. Once the attention is on that world, the world goes away. And I was reading the interview and he talked a lot about just how being scrutinized by the public just kind of put this pressure on him that made him not want to create. Going into it, he talked a lot about how, you know, very same sentiments that a lot of artists talk about. I was making it for fun. It was just me and my friends. And then it got to a point where there were so many people looking at us that it just wasn't the same. And it made him feel anxious, anxiety over the whole thing and just kind of like lock himself away from the world. 
And this is something that I honestly feel like a lot of major artists deal with, whether they talk about it or they don't. Like, I'm willing to bet you that if there was some type of mental health survey that went throughout the music industry, if the industry as a whole cared enough to have that conversation, I'm willing to bet that something like 60 to 70 percent of the artists probably really suffer from some type of mental health um, issues just because of the things that you go through being a famous icon, like just some of the treatments that you get, not the good treatments, not the free stuff and the jewelry and all that stuff, but I mean like the people treating you like a caged animal, the, the relinquishment of your privacy once you get to that point, the ownership that the world feels around you and your art, that if this was any other profession, we would be sending them to psychology, I mean, to a psychiatrist to talk about this and get help. But because it's music artists, we kind of look at it like, oh man, you know, suck it up, make your art, we love you, what do you have to complain about? And that's not right, it's not right at all. I wholeheartedly believe that that should be some type of psychiatric fund um, for music artists, at least when they sign to a label to where they can go sit in the building, talk to a therapist, talk to a psychiatrist, work through some of those issues, and then come out in a better headspace to be able to talk to and give us, the fans, the product and the music that we want. Because no matter how you feel about it or feel about these artists, if they're not in the right mental space, they're either going to give us shit product or they're not going to give us anything at all. And then we have a situation like Andrew 3000 where we don't hear from that artist for years and years and years until something like this comes up. So I commend Andrew 3000 for being um, one of the forefront of the artists talking about it. I know he hasn't been the only artist that talked about it. Like I said, there's been Joe Budden, there's been Summer Walker, but I commend him for being a legendary act coming and talk about it from a legendary standpoint, like the standpoint from him just being in the basement with the rest of the Dungeon family to him becoming a superstar today and just how that makes you feel, has made him feel. So if you have not listened to the interview, like I said, it's on Rick Rubin's podcast, the Broken Record Podcast, is their most recent episode. It's only like 57 minutes long, so it's not even that long of a conversation, but you get so much out of it, especially if you're an artist um, who's trying to become famous, who's trying to become a well-established artist, or if you are an artist who's a well-established artist and you feel this way, I know it helps to know that there's someone out there who's bigger than you that feels the exact same way also. So, like I said, thousand percent recommend that everyone go and check that out. And lastly, man, I got to leave y'all with some music recommendations or at least what's coming out today. So we got Gucci Mane, East Atlanta Santa, number three. Gucci always releases a project around Christmas time, East Atlanta Santa pretty much. Um, Young Thug has dropped the deluxe version of So Much Fun. There was a lot of talk around that because pretty much that was, that's being regarded as one of the best albums of the year. And we're, you know, I'm a Young Thug fan, so I'm excited to see him end the year off with a deluxe version of the album. Not even just because it's Young Thug, but because we haven't gotten a deluxe version of an album from an artist in a minute. Outside of that, Cameron drops his Purple Haze 2 album. Cameron's been on a really nice press run, talking it up, making sure we know this is coming out. NLE Chopper is dropping his Cottonwood EP. Currency is dropping his Back at Bernie's album. SOB and RBE drops their Strictly Only Brothers album. And then Popcorn has dropped his Vanquish album. That's all the new music releases that I know of for today. If you know anything else, drop those in the comment section below. Like I said, I'm always looking to be put onto new music and see what you guys are listening to, or at least are interested in seeing you know, what's coming out. I like seeing new music from other people's worlds. Outside of that, that's all I got for you guys today. Like I said, come and follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Cody Savior. Let me know some of your topics on some of these things. Do you think that Yellow Car should drop the lawsuit against Juice World? Do you feel Andre 3000 on his mental health issues regarding his music? Do you agree with 6 9 sentencing? Or do you think Tory Lanez needs to just shut the hell up or he needs to go ahead and air out Interscope? Let me know all of that on Instagram or Twitter or in the comment section below. Other than that, like and share this video, hit that subscribe button if you haven't, and I will see you guys next week. Peace.